to move on to our third speaker now of the evening, Melanie Phillips. Good evening, everybody. Well, I suppose I'm the backlash. <laughs> it's very nice of um, Baroness Kennedy, uh, a woman without power, uh, to try and restore my reputation by recalling me to my more idealistic youth. I believe that I am still a feminist. I simply define it differently. I have a slightly different perspective from my esteemed colleague, Germaine, because I actually uh, support the idea that Me Too has gone too far. Let me, before there's any misunderstanding, uh, say, if it needs to be said, that I most certainly uh, disapprove of rape, sexual assault of any kind, louche behavior, unwanted sexual advances, abuse of any sort of, uh, at, at all. And there is no argument in my mind that there are examples of discrimination against women and no argument that men, both powerful men and ordinary men, behave very badly towards some women. The argument that I'm making, however, is that the protest that started by the unmasking of Harvey, Harvey Weinstein has simply gone too far. My point is that on the back of undoubtedly serious or even criminal sexual misbehavior by some powerful men, Me Too has become a movement to demonize men in general as brutish and oppressive and present women in general as their victims. And I want to make three points in support of my argument, a point about disproportion, a point about complicity, and a point about hypocrisy. So let me dive in with disproportion. It is good, I am pleased, that men who have apparently sexually attacked or harassed women in the workplace, whether in starry workplaces or not, uh, should have stepped down. But we're not talking, when we talk about whether Me Too has gone too far, we're not talking only about rape or assault or harassment. I'm sure, I would hope, we all agree that rape should be prosecuted. It is one of the most serious crimes there is and is rightly regarded as so. My argument, and the argument behind the motion, has Me Too gone too far, is that it's gone far beyond that. Men are being pilloried for groping or flirting, putting their arm around a shoulder or up a skirt, leering or just wolf whistles. If this behavior undoubtedly may be ill-judged, boorish, pathetic, wrong, stupid, but surely it should not be lumped in with rape as proof of collective female victimhood. An example, making a pass at somebody now gets you on the sex offender register. Not long ago, a man put his arm around a female friend, she was distracted apparently by a wasp's nest, and kissed her on the shoulder and the head. She pulled away, he apologized. She reported him to the police, he first denied and then he admitted sexual assault, he was given a conditional discharge, and he was told to sign the sex offenders register. The judge said, quote, this was an impulsive act. You've had a very serious lesson taught to you. You do not make advances towards women who don't want you to. Now, what he did was wrong, but was what happened to him really a proportionate response? I would suggest that unwanted advances happen all the time. Men on women, women on men, Men on men, women on women. Are we really entering a world in which we are going to criminalize all inappropriate behavior? Once upon a time, women would have known what to do with that kind of behavior. They would have either verbally or physically made sure that the man understood that his advances were not wanted. But apparently that is no longer the case. We are all victims now. That's proportion or disproportion. Complicity. What we're talking about in most of these cases is unquestionably disgusting or reprehensible behavior. But what we have been seeing at the most, uh, uh, um, what has got the most attention is behavior that men have got away with because women colluded. Now, this provokes uproar, 
this idea that women are somehow complicit in what's happened to them because it is said to be blaming the victim. So let's look at blaming the victim. This claim of blaming the victim is a pernicious get out of jail free card for taking no responsibility at all for what you do and for infantilizing women, the very last thing that feminism should be doing. Look at the recent uproar over the President's Club, the charity event where, you may recall, scantily clad hostesses were allegedly groped and subjected to other louche behaviour. Now, the President's Club, uh, by all reported accounts, was unbelievably revolting. And I am very glad that it appears to have been shut down. It was disgusting. But the women involved, some of them were indeed uh, very upset uh, at what they were subjected to. But most of them knew what kind of event this was. There were reports in the press that when these women hostesses arrived, they were handed dresses to wear which revealed rather a lot of them. It was quite obvious what role they were going to play, even more obvious when they were asked or made to sign non-disclosure agreements. This is all terrible. Does it mean those women were victims? Are we really saying that women are so incapable that they were unable to decide for themselves that they would not wear those dresses, they would not sign those non-disclosure agreements, they would not take part in this kind of event? The assumption you see is that all women are being victimized. Now, this is simply not true. When you look at the Hollywood uh, uh, scandals, uh, the harassment and victimization of women in Hollywood. Some of those who were uh, uh, involved in these events knew about these men in advance. Harvey Weinstein, for example, others in a position of great power over their careers. And these women made a calculation in many cases to go along with it in order to advance their careers. For example, Uma Thurman, uh, who said that Weinstein made unwanted, degrading and unpleasant sexual advances towards her at the Savoy Hotel and in Paris in 1994, claims which Weinstein has denied. But she said nothing at the time and there were photographs taken of her subsequently, in subsequent years, companionably socialising with him as late as 2016. People like that, I believe, provided Weinstein and others with cover for their bad behaviour. Now, you could say, well, these women were intimidated. Well, I agree, it does happen that people are intimidated in certain situations where a person in power of your life is behaving inappropriately. It happens in all walks of life, but surely there comes a point where you can't say, I had no option but to go along with this. I mean, how many of you would submit to sexual harassment or attack to keep your job? If this happened to you, wouldn't you possibly decide that such a job was not for you after all? Wouldn't you complain to somebody in authority or go to the police? Wouldn't you tell your friends about what had happened to you? And if you did tell your friends, isn't it likely that your friends would not decide to present themselves to the same man for a job as happened over and over again in Hollywood where apparently everyone knew about Weinstein and others? And why does everybody assume, why are we supposed to assume that everybody, every woman who claims to be a victim is telling the truth? Many men who have been accused in this tsunami of claims of harassment or attack or violence, uh, many men uh, are subject to these claims which are unproved, yet Me Too assumes that they are all true. The accusation is tantamount to a declaration or a revelation of guilt. Guilt not, just, not only of the individual man, but of all men. <coughs> this assumption of female victimhood leads to injustice. We're told all the time, for example, that rape convictions in this country are said to be too low. Too low? By what standard can the rate of convictions be too low? Only by the standard of somebody who assumes that everyone who is accused of rape is actually guilty. Otherwise, it makes no sense that rape convictions are too low. In other words, when it comes to rape, the presumption of innocence is reversed. Helena talks about justice for women. 
I want justice for women, but in this case, I believe women are lending their name to injustice. And from where I'm coming from, that is not what feminism was ever about. The fact that sometimes there are ambiguous signals in sexual relations between men and women as a result of our permissive culture, or the fact that sometimes the woman, as one judge said recently, and my goodness, she was pilloried by other women for saying so, that sometimes the woman involved is too drunk to know what was happening, these things are brushed aside. The idea the woman has any responsibility for what may happen to her is considered to be a sense, is considered to be a backlash, a betrayal, not feminist. We're not, a, we're not sisters if we say that. The assumption is that all men who are accused of rape are guilty and all women accusing them are telling the truth. So in addition to the female victims of real rape and assault, we now have an increasing number of male victims of women's false allegations and injustice which has destroyed these men's lives. Oliver Mears, an Oxford student, cleared of rape after spending two years on bail. Liam Allen, a criminology student accused of rape. Police had failed to disclose texts from a woman that proved his innocence. So many of these cases of injustice against men in rape cases have there been that the Crown Prosecution Service has decided to review all cases of rape and sexual assault to find out how many more men it has wrongfully put on trial. My argument is that the assumption that all women are victims, which has led to miscarriages of justice against men, is undermining the measures needed to deal with real rape that takes place. Sexual harassment, it takes place, it is wrong, it should be dealt with condignly. But is it endemic, as we now hear? At the University of Chicago's general social survey asked a random sample of American women in 2014 whether they'd been sexually harassed by anyone while working in the previous 12 months. 3.6% said yes, down from 6% in 2002. Of course there is violence against women, but many domestic violence statistics are exaggerated, no time to go into the methodological flaws involved in many of them, and we never hear about women's violence against men. But the most reputable studies have shown over the years that when it comes to the violence initiated against another person in a domestic setting, the number of times that that violence is initiated is actually as much by women as men, if not more so. This whole idea of women's victimhood presents women as helpless, incapable of standing up for themselves. Isn't that precisely what feminism is supposed to be about? Helena says, power is coded male. Really? I don't recognize this world. In the world I live in, men and women are capable of abusing power and do so. Let's look at hypocrisy. We have had stellar examples of hypocrisy at the Golden Globes and the other Hollywood events, where we have women in dresses, in black, making a statement, dresses which plunge to here and a slash to here, using their sexuality to protest against being regarded as sexual objects. What they are saying by wearing these dresses is, does my conscience look big enough in this? These women have had stellar careers and made fortunes from being treated as sex objects. Did we hear a protest, Me Too protest, from Uma Thurman when in 1995 she was chosen by Empire magazine as one of the 100 sexiest stars in film history? Or in 2013, when GQ magazine named her as one of the 100 hottest women of the 21st century, I must have missed it. And many of these women only suddenly discovered their consciences about the endemic nature of sexual assault and harassment in Hollywood when Harvey Weinstein became no longer able to be useful to them. I was very glad when Helena said what she said about women in India and China, because until this moment, I don't think I'd heard anyone in Me Too uh, talk about women in the 
developing world. Certainly, there has been no equivalent protest, equivalent to Me Too, to protest at the treatment of women in the developing world. No Me Too pro type protest to protest about women under Sharia law, female genital mutilation, stones to death. No protest in support of the Iranian women who day by day are ripping off their headscarves in Iran and putting their lives on the line to get rid of the regime that oppresses them. And no one, as far as I know, in the Me Too movement in Britain or anywhere else has said anything in support of a Me Too nature about the fate of the thousands of poor young white girls in Rotherham and in Telford who were pimped and raped and assaulted and enslaved. Nothing. Instead, there is this claim of endemic and institutionalized injustice and violence against the women of the West who are in fact the most free, the most independent, the most educated and the richest women in the world today and in the history of the human race. In my view, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Me Too is simply about striking poses, literally wearing badges, proclaiming the wearer's virtue, about claiming the mantle of victimhood in order to demonize men, spread hatred against men, and make themselves as women morally untouchable. It's about taking the most uncharitable view possible of human behavior, male behavior, any behavior other than their own. It is about vanity, arrogance, and abuse of power. Me Too is very, very well named. It is not about fighting oppression or injustice or attack. For Western women in the Me Too protest, it's all about me. It has set back the cause of women and the cause of justice, which in my view, it should be one and the same cause. Well, I don't say me too. I say not in my name.